tonight on CBC Vancouver News. The real estate numbers in July have just been off the charts. Hot housing market. Home sales surge across the Lower Mainland amid the pandemic. Also. I was screaming, I don't want to die. Survivors of Lebanon's deadly explosion fear for their lives and their future. And. We've got initial hints that we could be on to a winning product. Ottawa inks deals to secure millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines, but doctors warn they're not ready yet. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. The province has hit its highest number of active COVID-19 cases since May, back when the province was still in stage one of our pandemic response. With 351 active cases now, that's just one sign of concern from today's update on the virus. Six people are in critical care. That's the highest number in six weeks. A total of nine people are now in hospital. 47 new cases have been confirmed. The biggest jump seen in the Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health regions. The silver lining, though, there were no new deaths in the past 24 hours. So BC's total remains at 195 people. No new community outbreaks have been announced, but the remote coastal nation of Klemtu, south of Kitimat, is locking itself down due to a suspected case of the virus. Residents are being asked to wear a mask at all times if they leave the house and to only leave their houses if they absolutely have to. With cases on the rise yet again, proper contact tracing of the virus becomes even more important, which is why the province is formally asking for federal help in accessing critical flight data during the pandemic. BC's transportation minister sent a letter this morning, a day after Dr. Bonnie Henry addressed the challenges they're facing. At issue is just how much information the provincial government is getting from the airlines. Health officials are hoping to get more specific details about passengers in order to better facilitate contact tracing, and that flow of information needs to be facilitated by the federal government. I am uh, regularly reminded by the airline industry, they're federally regulated. But uh, uh, COVID-19 isn't federally regulated or provincially regulated, it just is. And we have to deal with contact tracing and the better and more information we get, the better and more quickly, the better we can uh, keep the public safe. And that's in everybody's interest. In their defense, Air Canada says it's baffled by Dr. Henry's comments. The airline says it hasn't had a request from BC since March. WestJet says it hasn't had any reported cases of transmissions also since March. Despite COVID-19 grinding many parts of our economy to a halt, one industry appears to be doing very well, real estate. As Joel Ballard reports, home sales have rebounded on the Lower Mainland and they're racking up some big numbers. I'm pleasantly surprised. At the onset of the pandemic, many in the real estate industry were bracing for a rough summer. But home sale numbers from July are telling a different story. In Greater Vancouver, buyers purchased more than 3,100 homes in the last month. That's a jump of more than 22% compared to the same time last year. And both realtors and their clients have had to adapt to a new way of business. Buyers are more comfortable with all the protocols that have been put in place. They are getting more comfortable as are realtors with all the technology that's being employed now. So buyers are able to look at properties uh, virtually, do virtual tours, look at videos, floor plans, drive through the neighborhood. Pair that new comfort with pent up demand and a low interest rate and Gerber says you get a market that's hot. As people return to work, you've got a paycheck coming in. It gives you the opportunity to take a look at what your housing needs really are. And housing needs don't go away just because there's a virus out there. Along with sales, home prices also rose, hitting a benchmark of more than 1.3 million, 4.5% higher than last year. It's not just the greater Vancouver area that's experiencing a real estate boom. In the Fraser Valley, they recorded their second highest number of property sales ever in the month of July. The real estate numbers in July have just been off the charts. Realtors in the Fraser Valley saw a 44% jump in sales year over year, and for many of the same reasons as greater Vancouver. For the past few months, supply has been trying to keep up with demand, driving up prices, but the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board believes that will soon change. 
the demand and supply is starting to balance out. And I think what we'll see in the month of August and September, that coming back into equilibrium a lot more than it has been in the past. A promising sign, he says, for both buyers and sellers. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, BC paramedics responded to more overdose calls in July than any month in the province's recorded history, an average of 87 per day, painting a grim picture of the overdose crisis amid the pandemic. Paramedics attended just over 2,700 total overdose calls compared to the monthly average of around 2,000. Vancouver saw the most calls with 739, followed by Surrey with 244 and Victoria with 139. The BC Emergency Health Service says the survival rate was around 95 percent, but they did not report death statistics, which is the job of the BC Coroner Service. Metro Vancouver's latest homeless count shows more older people are without a place to live, while younger people have found housing. But the count was done at the beginning of March, right before COVID-19 hit with full force, so the numbers may not reflect the current reality. The count shows 3,634 people were homeless, about the same number as 2017. But the new figures indicate those older than 55 now make up one quarter of the homeless population. That's up 2% from 2017. But the number of those living under 25 on the streets has been cut in half from 16 to 8%. Vancouver, Langley and Surrey recorded the highest number of people experiencing homelessness. Vancouver police are looking for a suspect who was allegedly involved in a violent sexual assault in Oppenheimer Park in April. She failed to return to a halfway house and now police are asking for your help to find her. 33-year-old Nicole Edwards and another suspect face 15 charges in relation to the Oppenheimer incident. She was last seen July 20th at a halfway house in Surrey. She's described as 5 foot 3 inches tall, around 125 pounds. Edwards has brown hair and a tattoo on her neck, reading Wakesh on her neck. Anyone with information is asked to call VPD immediately. A state of emergency has now been declared in Beirut after yesterday's devastating explosion. The Lebanese government is calling the blast a catastrophe. Reporter Rebecca Collard is in Beirut with the latest on what's happening there. I'm very close now, about 500 meters away from Beirut's port, and it's been more than 24 hours since this explosion took place, and there are still volunteers just cleaning up the rubble and glass off the streets. It is just absolutely a disaster still down here. In the distance, I can hear ambulances. We understand that the search and rescue crews are still going through buildings in this massive radius that has been affected by this blast, looking for people that might be injured and trying to take them to hospitals here in Beirut. We also understand that those hospitals are completely overwhelmed. The government is now saying as many as 5,000 people are injured, more than 130 people are dead. And that number, unfortunately, is likely to rise throughout tonight and possibly even into tomorrow as, as more people are unaccounted for and as these rescue crews continue to go through these buildings. All day today, there was volunteers that were coming from all around the country to Beirut to help clean up the streets because I don't know if you can see behind me this even this this is one of the not as poorly badly affected area but this is all just glass all over the ground um there's there's a barrier set up here uh there's down the street there's many shops that have their their windows smashed out and even apartments in this neighborhood which is about four kilometers away from the blast site and a lot of people I'm talking to are saying they absolutely blame the government and they plan, as soon as this rubble is picked up, that they're going to be back in the streets protesting because they say this is the sort of mismanagement and corruption and neglect that they've been suffering for decades, and they're not going to stop their protests. They're going to continue on. Rebecca Collard, CBC News, Beirut. The tragic aftermath of that deadly explosion in Beirut is being felt around the world and here in B.C. One survivor was in the process of joining her husband here in Vancouver. As Andrea Ross reports, she says she's one of many young people whose dream of a better life has taken another hit. I was screaming, I don't want to die, and saying some stuff related to God, and please God be with me. Rowan Al-Zahed was at home with her husband's family when the explosion happened. Initially, they thought it was an earthquake. Everyone was like, everyone was screaming and running from the kitchen to the living room. Then she realized it was unlike anything she'd ever experienced. We saw like the big pink uh, cloud 
and I don't know, but I'm till now I'm shivering. I can't imagine what happened last night. The family lives just a five minute drive from the blast, but miraculously, none of them were injured. She applied for permanent residency in Canada in March, hoping to join her husband in Vancouver. But she's heard nothing since the pandemic began, and she says she's desperate to leave a country she feels has failed its citizens. It's really sad, Andrea. And I'm just 24, and you feel like as if every plan you had in, in your life is totally gone. Not because of the explosion only. We've been going through this like years before, years and years. The, the government is corrupted. Salah Faraj left Lebanon for Canada in 1971. His family is still there, and he says their homes were badly damaged in the explosion. I felt like it's one of the biggest tragedy that uh, Lebanon ever went through. Uh, it's too sad. Uh, we've been we've been going through tragedy after tragedy for the last 30, 40 years, and still going. The country is facing economic collapse that has been worsened by COVID-19. He says it will take a global effort for Lebanon to recover from the latest blow. We will never give up. We will rebuild Beirut, and Beirut will come back with the support of the good international uh, leaders all over the world. Others are looking for help on a more local level. I would like to call on, on, on the BC Ministry of Health, on the BC government, on the Canadian NGO, on BC charities to start helping Lebanon. Minister Adrian Dix was asked today whether the province would commit to helping Lebanon. He said yes and that he'd consult the premier on the next steps. We're living in an age and I think some, some people in some parts of the world forget this, where events in one part of the world affect all of us. Another tragedy in a difficult year. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. We'll have more on the destruction of Beirut coming up at the bottom of the hour. And tonight, a vigil is planned at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and we'll have more on that gathering on our late news at 11. Businesses looking to buy electric vehicles could soon be eligible for rebates worth as much as $50,000. The province announced $2 million in additional funding for the Clean BC Initiative program today. From electric buses to motorcycles and trucks, they're all covered. The rebates range from $1,700 to $50,000 per vehicle. They're available for businesses, local governments and nonprofits purchasing five or fewer vehicles. Our leadership in the electric vehicle sector not only supports our Clean BC goals, it supports the creation of good jobs here in British Columbia. Harbour Air has already used the rebate to buy a zero emission shuttle bus. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis BC. Using more energy these days, we've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how-to videos and more. Time for our first check-in with weather. Meteorologist, meteorologist, easy for me to say, Johanna Wagstaff. <laughs> now with the forecast, gardeners are going to be happy with a bit of a refresh, Joe. I don't uh, think it's just gardeners, but particularly gardeners. Things are looking mighty dry out there. Rain is finally coming. I know we've been talking it up for about a week now, and it is just a, a one-day hit we're getting, but... It's moving in quickly. Let me start off with a look at the temperatures because it is another gorgeous, very summer like day across the south coast at 25 at YBR feeling more like 27, 28 if you're away by the water, just uh, by a few blocks even. So another hot one out there. That's thanks to this high pressure. But check out that cold front very quickly tracking down across the island. In fact, already bringing showers uh, to northern and central sections of the island and that is what will fill, be filling in for Metro Vancouver later on tonight. So let me just break it down for you. I think we're going to stay dry through the next couple of hours, but look for increasing clouds. It's still another muggy, hot overnight. The rain beginning to fill in. Most models in pretty good agreement uh, between 12 and 2 a.m. So I think that's when the first rain will start. Uh, falling the heaviest in quotation marks around 8 a.m. because this isn't a soaker. I'm thinking five to 10 millimeters. We'll talk more about amounts uh, coming up. By the afternoon hours, this system is already starting to taper and we might get some sunny breaks. So I'll talk more about amounts and what this rain will do to the interior where they also need it coming up. But believe it or not, the rain will be here in the next 12 hours. Okay, we'll be watching for it. Thanks for that, Joe. And a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And CBC Vancouver is also on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram.
COVID-19 vaccine trials are well underway around the world, and Canada has signed deals for millions of doses once they're ready. Details coming up. And thanks for watching us online, where we are ad-free during the regular TV commercial breaks. An exciting trip to the Disney store for a young girl living with autism and her family took a bit of a turn recently. She had trouble wearing a mask inside, so her family was asked to leave. As Jacob Barker reports, the mother says the store should have been understanding of her daughter's condition. I think it's pink. Elsa's my favorite. <laughs> Ruby Belarjon loves <laughs> Disney. Her room stands as a testament to that. Do you like Moana? Yes. Yeah. She yeah. recently lost her first tooth, and her mother Sarah thought it would be a good excuse to head to the Disney store. So she wanted to take her tooth fairy money and uh, go buy a toy with it. So earlier this week, they took the two-hour trip from Windsor to London to visit the shop. Her daughter struggles wearing masks because she has autism. In London, children under the age of 12 are exempt from the mandatory face covering bylaw, as are those with underlying medical conditions. But we brought it anyway. Um, we've been practicing at home. At the entrance, they were told they'd have to sanitize their hands and wear a mask. So we explained to the woman at the front that, um, you know, we have... My daughter has autism, so we're, um, she has sensory issues. So the woman said to try your best and, uh, and go ahead. She kept it on for a couple minutes and then it started to fall underneath her nose. Um, so we kept trying to fix it. The family says it was approached by several staff members informing them Ruby must wear a mask. Balerjan says she explained her daughter's circumstances each time, but as she found out, it was not up for debate. Yes, she says, I know people on the spectrum, so they should they can wear a mask, so she should as well. What they don't understand is she's six years old. She's, even at that age in general, if you're a typical child, it's hard to wear. Um, so for her, it was, you know, a whole other issue. Even so, they tried to keep the mask on, but eventually it came off altogether, and a staff member told them they had five minutes to make their purchases and leave the store. Balerjan says she wanted to make the incident public to raise awareness. So I just want to, you know, take the platform that I do have and, you know, tell people to educate themselves, ask questions. We will answer them if you ask. We did ask Disney about the incident and a spokesperson said all of their stores require people to wear face coverings and they regret the family was disappointed. Balerjean says the store has invited the family back, but she says that's not enough. I think an apology would have went a long way and and even just you know we were speaking to the staff and educating them and they didn't do that jacob barker cbc news windsor tough situation for a family we take advantage of the fact if if you have to put on a mask you put on a mask because mm -hmm. we don't deal with that right and um, i know many of us may not necessarily think about first of all the kids it's tough enough and then a child with uh, certain conditions makes it even harder, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, stay with us. More on what's making headlines around the COVID-19 pandemic from across the country in just a few minutes. Stick around. The federal government has now signed deals with two big drug makers to help secure millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines. The deals are with Pfizer and Moderna. As Evan Dyer reports, both are already working on vaccines. We are extremely pleased to be among the first countries to establish these agreements. The two companies Canada has contracted with, Pfizer and Moderna, can both show encouraging early results. Moderna's formula got a favorable review in the New England Journal of Medicine. Pfizer is working on four different vaccine tracks that also show promise. So we've got initial hints that we could be on to a winning product. We're just not, uh, we're just not there yet. The government isn't saying how much it's buying or how much it's paying. The information that we can reveal at the current time regarding uh, doses in particular is uh, being kept confidential because uh, we are taking a prudent approach to the negotiations while we are engaged with other suppliers. 
But the terms of Pfizer's deal with Washington are public. The U.S. government will pay Pfizer nearly two billion U.S. dollars for a hundred million doses of vaccine, with an option to buy half a billion more. We also know that Canada has ordered 75 million syringes, or about two for every Canadian. Gardam says governments have no choice but to cover their bets yeah, as best they pickle, can. Right? I mean, let's say, for example, uh, nine months from now, it becomes very clear that a vaccine that we don't have, that you know, we didn't pre-order, turns out to be the best vaccine. Then we're going to be in line with everybody else trying to get a hand on it. Canada has been burned before. It agreed in May to work with Chinese firm CanSino on a vaccine with trials to be done in this country, only to have the government of China block delivery of that drug to Canada ever since. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Chelsea, Quebec. And as teams around the world race to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, many Canadians say they won't be first in line to get it. A new survey shows around a third of respondents want to hold off. And as Lauren Pelly explains, that could derail efforts to protect the most vulnerable. I get the flu shot every year, so why wouldn't I get the a vaccine if there is one. I don't know if it's going to cause any complications later. Ask people if they'll be first in line to get a COVID-19 vaccine. I want to know what would be in the vaccine. And responses are all over the map. I guess it's just you don't want to be the first, you know. A new Angus Reid survey found half of Canadians say they'll get a COVID-19 vaccination as soon as it's available. But around a third of respondents want to wait a while. 14% say they don't want to get vaccinated at all and another 8% just aren't sure. People need to widely accept it. And we know from other vaccines that there's a lot of discontent and fear. In this case, fear may stem from just how quickly COVID vaccine candidates are being developed and tested. The survey found among those hesitant about getting a vaccine, three quarters are worried about possible side effects. All of the clinical trials have data safety and monitoring boards which review all of the data to ensure that the vaccines are safe. Canadian vaccine experts stress all vaccines are rigorously tested on thousands of people. Those are big numbers and should allow us to get a really good handle on um, safety considerations for, for really large portions of the population. Those efforts may not be enough to ease all worried minds. So if a large chunk of the population opts to not get vaccinated, that could leave some of society's most vulnerable at risk. That's because those at risk of the most severe COVID-19 impacts, like the elderly and people with compromised immune systems, are also the least likely to gain protection from vaccination. Elderly people, you know, are notoriously hard to vaccinate because um, their immune system becomes what we call senescent. It just doesn't react as strongly as it did when they were at younger ages. Experts say it's up to everyone else to get a vaccine if we want to have widespread immunity. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. A COVID-19 travel ban imposed by Newfoundland and Labrador back in May is now being challenged on constitutional grounds. The rules at that time meant a Nova Scotia woman was denied entry even after her mother died. As Heather Gillis reports, she's now taking the province to court. This was my mother, my mother who I was extremely close to. Kim Taylor's mother Eileen unexpectedly died on May 5th in St. John's, a day after the province's travel ban took effect. The ban only allowed permanent residents, asymptomatic essential workers, and those with extenuating circumstances to enter the province. Taylor, who lives in Nova Scotia, had a self-isolation plan and emailed asking for an exemption to go to her mother's funeral, but was denied after waiting days. I never in a million years thought I would get a no. Taylor said the rejection brought more stress to an already brutal situation, grieving the loss of a loved one. <laughs> no other family should have to suffer what we went through. Taylor is challenging the constitutionality of Newfoundland and Labrador's travel ban in Supreme Court. John Drover is arguing Taylor's case pro bono. His client isn't seeking damages or financial compensation. It's not about money, and that's why I've never sought monetary damages. It's about, um, you know, as a Canadian citizen, I should have been able to get on that plane the very 
that very night, the very next day, whenever I chose to go, as long as I followed the rules. Meanwhile, Roselyn Sullivan, representing the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, is pushing to take part in the case. She says the travel ban is unconstitutional. It should be federal jurisdiction, and it infringes on Canadians' mobility rights under the Charter. She says powers that allow police to search, detain, and remove people from the province without due process are also problematic. We should not have to wait for someone's charter rights to be breached. Just because it hasn't been used um, doesn't mean it's constitutional. Lawyers from the province argue the Civil Liberties Association shouldn't take part in the case and that the charter allows people to move or take up residence not to visit. The case to determine whether the province's travel ban is constitutional will be heard at Supreme Court all week. Witnesses are expected to include Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Even with prospects of a vaccine, COVID-19 has still proven to be a major disruptor in American politics. Both presidential nominating conventions this month will mostly be virtual. Paul Hunter explains why this is so consequential. They are, by design, spectacles. The nominating conventions of the major U.S. political parties at once giant love-ins and free primetime infomercials. With the big event, the acceptance speech for the nominee. Millions watched Donald Trump's in 2016. And we will make America great again. God bless you and good night. I love you. Hillary Clinton's was no different. The conventions and those speeches rally party workers and motivate voters big time. So consider the news today that Joe Biden will not be attending his convention in Milwaukee, that Biden's speech will be on video only from his home state, Delaware. Why? COVID. I think it's a, an indication of the seriousness with which he uh, judges that uh, the situation. Democratic Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi today applauded Biden for steering clear of big gatherings during the pandemic. The increase in numbers uh, just demands uh, that we keep our distances. So where will Trump accept his nomination? He too has said it won't be at his party's convention in North Carolina, noting today his preferred choice, as it was on the 4th of July, is in his own symbolically superpowered backyard. If I use the White House, we save tremendous amounts of money for the government in terms of security, traveling. Say critics, it also wrongly turns the White House into a Donald Trump re-election weapon. By saying he's going to completely politicize it is something that uh, uh, should be rejected right out of hand. Wherever Trump ends up, and it may well be right here, both conventions are certain to be like no other. Likewise, no doubt, the campaigns to follow. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Overseas now, city officials in Paris are weighing whether to make masks mandatory outdoors in part of the French capital. Parisians? Not so sure. I still think that there's a, uh, it is, I am reluctant to it. I do think it's a little bit too far, yeah. The government's top advisory body is warning of the likelihood of a second wave of the coronavirus this fall or winter. And the number of infections has risen over the past two weeks. Some other French cities have already ordered masks be worn on busy streets. In Paris, talks are already underway as to which neighborhoods might adopt that new rule. It could be shopping streets, the banks of the River Seine, and city parks and gardens. And in Australia, record high numbers of COVID-19 cases in the state of Victoria have led to the toughest ever measures there. All non-essential businesses in the city of Melbourne have been ordered to shut down. And as freelance reporter Rochelle Harrison-Pless tells us, they go as far as requiring essential workers to carry passes to leave home. Closed until further notice. Non-essential businesses, the latest casualty of Melbourne's stage four restrictions. Shutting up shop for at least the next six weeks as part of tougher measures in a bid to stop coronavirus from spreading. The streets of Australia's second largest city have largely emptied since a harder lockdown and nightly curfew kicked in on Sunday. Widely seen as short-term pain for long-term gain. 
we all continue to do as we should, making better choices, then we'll keep our community safe and we will get to the other side of this. The alternative, of course, is these restrictions uh, lasting for much longer than they should. Authorities also warn of a crackdown for those who break the rules. People found breaching isolation orders could be slapped with a fine of up to $19,000. Figures released on Friday revealed more than one in four people who tested positive to COVID-19 were not self-isolating. That's prompted more boots on the ground. Australia deploying hundreds of extra troops to assist police and health officials on the front line. Bolstering efforts to enforce a statewide lockdown that's in place until at least mid-September. Rochelle Harrison Pless, CBC News, Sydney. An unusual moving tribute to victims of the pandemic took place last night in Brazil. Dozens of cars, their sound systems tuned into the sounds of mechanical respirators and intensive care unit monitors filled the roads driving backwards to the city cemetery. The funeral procession was guided by supporters in lab coats, face shields and masks. At the cemetery, a trumpeter played the anthem in front of a sketch of one victim. Brazil's death count from the virus is expected to reach a grim 100,000 people in the coming days. Investigators in Lebanon are digging through the rubble for survivors and answers to yesterday's deadly explosion. What they've uncovered so far, next. In British Columbia, a special summer camp was held this week for families with children who are deaf. The focus was on communication in an atmosphere that mixes fun with learning. Karen Chickaluck reports. A summer's day in Paradise Valley, and the Pranzel family heads out for a stroll. Normally, they live and work in Vancouver. Steve is a policeman, and Patty is a registered nurse. The Pranzels could easily be the ideal family on vacation, but not quite. They're at a learning camp for deaf children. Two years ago, both their daughters were diagnosed as profoundly deaf. Their parents each happened to carry a recessive gene for deafness. You know, when you dream about having children, you, dream, you don't dream about having deaf children and what you're going to do with them. You dream about having hearing children and all these hopes and expectations that you have for these children. So that was really difficult to accept at first that both of these children were deaf. You already have enough grief because of what's happened to you. Now to feel that you're losing your child and they tell you it may be years before they can get simple ideas across. How many? Kristen is three and a half now. When she was two, she discovered she wasn't like her mommy and daddy. Kristen couldn't hear what they were saying and she had no way of telling them what she wanted and how she felt. This is a rose. If she wanted a, a drink of milk or a bottle, she had no way to tell us that except by, by pulling us, you know, getting us up and pulling us to wherever it was and, and pointing. And if we didn't get the right thing, it would upset her and it would upset me because I felt bad. I thought, I'm letting her down. But it's not just the deaf children who must learn to communicate. This is an advanced sign language class for the parents at the camp. They're deaf people and we are not and it's hard for us to think like they do and to be deaf Erin Prandtl is just two and she's just starting to learn how to sign her parents work at making things easier even when they talk amongst themselves Steve and Patty always use their hands this way even if we're only talking with each other and not to them they're still watching us sign and they're still picking up vocabulary and, and things like that from that. It's a constant learning process for the entire Pranzel family. In this case, watch how Kristen puts her skills to the test once she discovers Aaron in her seat. Move, please. No. <laughs> Maybe you can change. Here, sit down on Aaron's chair. No, she's moved. Oh, 
Aaron decided to oh. move without right. fighting. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> the message? Kids will be kids no matter what their language. And here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. BC's COVID case count is up. We have 351 active cases, the highest since May. Nine people are in hospital, six of them in intensive care. Thankfully, no one has died from the disease in the past day, though we have lost almost 200 people. As people return to work, you've got a paycheck coming in. It gives you the opportunity to take a look at what your housing needs really are. And housing needs don't go away just because there's a virus out there. The Lower Mainland is seeing a boom in real estate, even amid the pandemic. Home sales in Greater Vancouver spiked 22% compared to July of last year. That number jumped to 44% in the Fraser Valley. Industry insiders believed pent-up demand and low interest rates have led to this sudden surge. I know I'm just 24, and you feel like as if every plan you had in, in your life is totally gone. Not because of the explosion only. We've been going through this like years before. Years and years. Survivors of Beirut's deadly explosion say their dreams of a better life has taken another hit. Rwani El Sahed is in the process of applying for permanent residency to join her husband here in Vancouver. She says despite her love for Lebanon, she's desperate to leave a country she feels has failed its citizens. Now she's unsure when she'll ever be able to leave. Rescuers are still digging through the rubble in Beirut tonight after yesterday's deadly blast killed at least 135 people. The city has a long road ahead, but as Renee Filipponi reports, the focus is still on the desperate search for missing loved ones. A day after the blast that catastrophically shook Beirut, the true scale of the disaster emerged. Throughout the day, more bodies are pulled from the rubble and more families' fears are confirmed. Rescue workers continue to search for the missing while their families hold out hope. We have been all over every hospital in Beirut, says a man relentlessly looking for his 27-year-old son. We don't know if he is dead or alive. That desperation has many reaching out online, sharing images of missing loved ones, looking for any indication they survived the blast. The explosion was so powerful, officials say it damaged half the city and was fueled by 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate. Touring the damage, the Lebanese president, Michel Aoun, said the chemicals were stored unsafely in a warehouse for years. We are determined to investigate and reveal what happened as soon as possible, he says. Several port officials have been placed under house arrest. Mirna Halo navigates through the debris inside the home she grew up in. Her mother was injured during the blast, but it's nothing compared to what she saw yesterday. I saw people walking like ghosts in the streets. There is, they, 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 they were full of blood. Some people were lying down on the street, unable to, to get up. Maybe they were, maybe they died, I don't know. The blast also destroyed a large grain silo containing critically important food reserves, and the damage left hundreds of thousands homeless at a time when the country is dealing with an ongoing political and economic crisis, and of course, the coronavirus. Local community groups are rallying to help those in need. Some say they have lost faith in the government. People are there for each other. We're not going to wait for some government entity to come and... Uh, uh, fix things for us. They never did for the past 30 years. The resilience, the resignation of the Lebanese people captured in this video of an elderly woman playing piano in her damaged apartment as glass is swept from the room. The weary carry on. This is the grim reality in a deeply scarred Beirut. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London.
And there are still questions about the amount of highly explosive ammonium nitrate that blew up in Beirut and how it got there. As Thomas Dagler reports, one human rights advocate claims officials ignored warnings that it was dangerous. Amid the chaos of the blast came a clear clue as to its origin, that lingering reddish smoke, a telltale sign of ammonium nitrate, a fairly common substance that this expert considers more dangerous than dynamite. This house, will, we need only a few kilograms to destroy it. Farmers use ammonium nitrate as fertilizer. It's harmless when stored properly, but not when mixed with fuel, then lit. Like in Beirut, where that fire was the first sign of looming disaster. Oh my. That would have been enough to start to heat it up, to then come into this chain reaction event that is unstoppable. It all came from this Moldovan flagged ship that docked in 2013. It was forced to unload all the ammonium nitrate it was carrying, but then the cargo was stored at the port and never moved. We are really a devastated country because no one wanted to take the responsibility. Human rights activist Wadi Al Asmar obtained a letter that appears to show some officials repeatedly warned of the risk. In October 2017, the director of Lebanese Customs urged a judge to order removal of the material due to the danger of leaving these goods in the place they are and to those working there. They did a lot of, I would say, paperwork to cover themselves, but no one took an action to protect the population. The chemical has caused death and destruction before. Think back to the 95 Oklahoma City bombing. The attacker used two and a half tons of ammonium nitrate as a weapon of choice. At the Toronto 18 terror trial, police demonstrated how just one ton of ammonium nitrate could do damage. Now imagine in Beirut there was a staggering 2,750 tons in one place. It took a huge load to cause this much destruction, but it took negligence to claim this many lives. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. She was known for being nice and caring, but why is Ellen DeGeneres now apologizing? Coming up, I'll look at the allegations of a toxic work environment. And at 6.40, almost 41, there's a live look at Tofino's Crystal Cove Resort. They have a beach there. Clouds are already coming ashore ahead of some rain, and that much needed precipitation is coming to the lower mainland as well. Johanna will be back with the damp full forecast after this. One element of the house is it has a tree-like configuration to it. What we tried to develop was the notion that the house is part of the landscape. Hi! Come on in, come on in! Hi, I'm Benita. Hi, I'm Craig. Welcome to the treehouse. Each floor is, in a way, meant to represent different components of the forest layers. The design philosophy is, is one of a journey, and this is the beginning of the journey from darkness into light. When I, we were picking lights, I was looking for something that looked like water drops. It had the appearance of falling water, and this was meant to be the, when the rain comes and the water streaming through the different layers of the forest. When we were doing the renovation, I, I, was imp I couldn't believe that there was this rock wall behind it. Why would you want to try to hide this? They're basically, it kind of meant to be a, a place of solitude and reflection. It had the added bonus that we didn't realize at the time, that it comes when it rains here to enjoy the, uh, the water. It's like bright and airy, and you can see the sunlight streaming in, and uh, you can really feel the seasons and the trees, and you can actually see the canopy of the trees. It certainly has the, the, the most open, open views. These pillars are like torches, so in the evening time, if you just have those on, then it looks like there's fire inside the house. The moon actually comes down in through the glass of the, of the bathroom and straight into the bathtub. So it's like you're bathing in moonlight. What I like about the kitchen is that there's two opposing views. One is that if you're facing, using the cooktop, you're facing outward towards the water. So you have a panoramic view basically of the, of the water and of the mountains. But if you turn 180 degrees, you're now faced with the forest, which is a view of solitude and kind of confinement. Just by relocating slightly, you kind of have this dramatically different mindset. 
The house is really wonderful when it rains or when it's stormy. It's quite uh, loud on in this area, so you can hear it and see it. When it's windy, the pine cones will hit the house. The metal, it will clang, and it's really quite dramatic. I like to decorate with, with natural items. This is a Chinese gourd. It's dried. And my father grew this in the middle of the city. He's inscribed a poem on it about the fleetingness of life. The, you know, as all things pass away, the sun and the moon and the seasons, and like this gourd, you know, so we should treasure every moment. You feel the neighborhood. When it's stormy, again, the, the house is interesting and you can watch the storms roll in. In many ways, over time, the actual back view is becoming my favorite because it's such a steeply graded backyard. If you're just looking straight out, you just see forest. Everyone, I think, has a different reaction to how some people actually find it quite interesting. I think a lot of people kind of wonder why. why. Yeah. It's not the most practical of uh, places to live. A lot of people that have been in the house, they either love it or they don't understand it. But you know, the, if, if I've invited you, they understand that, you know, that we, this is the house that fits us. When your backyard is burning, is anywhere safe? I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Typhoon-driven downpours pelted parts of eastern China, uprooting trees, flooding properties, and disrupting many lives. County officials issued a top-level alert for the typhoon yesterday afternoon. By then, gusts were recorded at 115 kilometers per hour, and swollen rivers were overflowing their banks, washing out roads. Dozens of homes were evacuated in the region as far as 140 kilometers inland, and other people were warned to stay indoors. Almost 700 tourists were stranded in the area. The weather update is brought to you by Fortis, B.C., Using more energy these days? We've got energy saving tips, easy upgrades, how to videos, and more. And our Johanna Wagstaff has been watching that typhoon very carefully. So, Joe, that typhoon now moving on from China, heading north towards Korea, right? That's right, Leanne, and re-strengthening as it hit the water again. So watching this closely over the next 24 hours, I actually want to show you a satellite image uh, as this typhoon moved back over into the open water. You can see that closed circulation of the eye. It is weakening and it is going to merge with a system in uh, South Korea, but this is also a place that has been inundated by rainfall uh, for the past uh, six weeks, in fact. So high alert uh, for the peninsula, and uh, we'll keep you posted on that. It's just moving in as we speak. We're watching a different system, of course, here on the West Coast. We're watching the approach of the rain and uh, just getting reports that it has started raining in Tofino. So that cold front is tracking down towards the southeast. 27 Humidex in 3YVR. It is muggy once again across the south coast. Things are going to change dramatically, though, not just as far as the rain, but those temperatures will be quite a bit cooler for the whole province. We're talking 5 to 10 degrees. OK, here's the rainfall map we were really looking for. The dark greens to the yellows, that's the 20 to 60 millimeter range. I think for Metro Vancouver, that's really the top end of what we might get closer to the 20 millimeter. Uh, more likely we'll end up with 5 to 10. And then uh, all eyes on the interior where we really need it. The Kootenays looking to get some good rainfall, but the Okanagan may maybe 5 to 10 millimeters, and that will come with a gusty cold front that also means new lightning strikes, so possible new fire starts in the next 24 hours, but then look at this temperature cool down. That is really going to help the fire situation. Uh, this is for tomorrow. You can see going from 37 and through Osoyoos today to 27 tomorrow and staying in that cooler range as we head into Friday as well. So a much needed drop in temperatures across the province, uh, even though we're not getting the soaking rain. We'll take a look at the north if uh, we have a minute coming up. Uh, 21 tomorrow for Metro Vancouver.
Uh, that, sorry, that's tonight, 20 for tomorrow. Uh, that's the breakdown as we head into the forecast. Definitely cooler. So there's the north, 17 up towards Smithers, 15 in through Prince George. As I take you through Friday, uh, sticking in that cold air mass for another day. So our one hit wonder coming tomorrow. We might end up with some sunny breaks before the end of the day. And look at that nice rebound as we head into another good looking weekend. Thanks very much, Joe. Canada's Museum of Human Rights has been found to have a toxic environment, one with pervasive racism, sexism, and homophobia. This comes on the heels of a damning report, and as Karen Pauls tells us, its temporary CEO is apologizing and vowing change. The report is troubling. It's concerning. Pauline Rafferty says she was shocked and surprised when allegations of racism, discrimination, homophobia and sexual harassment and assault surfaced in June. We have to apologize unreservedly. People have been hurt. We have um, shown that we have not been a workplace that holds up to the ideals of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. The allegations came to light after this rally in support of Black Lives Matter. Current and former employees started a social media campaign. Dozens of people came forward with their stories. It's clear that there's some shortcomings here. Then CEO John Young first apologized, then resigned. The museum launched an external review. Laurel Harris's report is scathing. Racism within the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is pervasive and systemic. Black, Indigenous and people of colour have been adversely impacted physically, emotionally and financially by their experiences within the institution. The report's 44 recommendations include changes to recruiting and hiring practices, content and interactions with the public. The board says it will implement five immediately. It has also committed at least $250,000 for training in anti-racism and sexual harassment. We very much want to make sure that our mandate, which is to promote respect for human rights, is something that we do internally as well as externally. The chair of the board's new Diversity and Inclusion Committee says she'll champion the concerns of employees. We are very sorry that we have failed in this regard and that we did not take the appropriate steps in the past. These former employees started that social media campaign. They don't have a lot of hope the report will change anything. Hearing things and seeing things are very different and that trust is not going to come back on my end until I see a difference in behaviour. The least the museum could do is follow through with those 44 recommendations. It sounds like a lot but it, it's not um, coming from someone who's been in there and knows how much work actually has to be done. Phase two of the external review will begin shortly and focus on exclusion and equity. In the meantime, the federal government is looking for a new CEO who can help lead the museum through this crisis. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, for decades, Ellen DeGeneres has built her brand on fun, kindness and generosity. But a growing number of former staffers say the Queen of Nice ruled over a domain that could be monstrous. Deanna Sumanak Johnson looks at the allegations of toxic work environment and worse that are now threatening that brand. He's like my brother from another mother. <laughs> on the talk show Ellen, they traded banter and jokes every day. But behind the scenes, Tony Okumbawa said he did experience and feel the toxicity of the environment. Yeah. Ellen DeGeneres' well. former yeah. DJ is the most recent staffer to allege that the show built on its host's is, uh, Be Kind motto was anything but. I mean be kind to everyone. Christy Lee Yandoli broke the story of dozens of former and some current staffers of Ellen DeGeneres who said they experienced a toxic work environment, sexual harassment. One staffer said she was subjected to racist comments. A head writer had said to her, oh, I don't know your name, I only know the name of the white employees who work here, and came up against a lot of barriers, she said. I also spoke to former employees who said they were fired after asking for bereavement days to attend family funerals. While some staffers said DeGeneres herself could be cold and berating, the worst of the allegations were against DeGeneres' executive team, not the comedian herself. 
a lot of former employees say they find it very hard to believe Ellen was completely unaware of the ongoings on the show. One of the ways I spread kindness is with my Be Kind boxes. Something that could damage the brand of any beloved star, but especially one who built her empire on niceness. I think her brand is in danger, but I think she can still turn it around. But she will need to truly demonstrate how she's turning it around. Some celebrities like Katy Perry and Kevin Hart have come to DeGeneres' defense on social media. But this Canadian PR strategist says getting all the big names back on her show might be tougher now. I would just wonder, like, as a celebrity publicist, would I book my talent on her show? We have been doing the show from my house since March. Ellen's March? show ratings fell in the last no few weeks. Warner Brothers is conducting an internal investigation, but the network has not indicated its desire to end the show. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah, that's a coyote with its head stuck in a jar. The rescue coming up after this. Well, the first seal pups rescued this year by the Marine Mammal Rescue Center have finished their rehab, which means it's a happy day on BC Shores release day. 
healthy, back up to weight, and equipped with the skills to survive on their own. It did take some coaxing, but four young seals were set free today, even if one looked like it wasn't quite ready to leave rescuers yet. Fosarelli, Yuki, Okiana, and who could forget, Seely Dan yes. are back in the open ocean. And by the way, that hesitation, apparently plenty of seals go through that. We've released, you know, thousands of marine mammals. Some bolt into the ocean, some take their time. It just depends, you know, it's a new surrounding for them. These are animals that have only spent one or two days in the wilds before they were rescued. So it's a totally new environment for them. So not unusual for us to see this today. Failure to launch, is that what they call it? The Marine Mammal Rescue Center has cared for more than 60 seals so far this year. Best name for a seal. <laughs> A conservation officers in Maple Ridge saved a coyote recently that was in over its head. Yeah, the not so wily coyote was discovered in distress after it likely tried to lick something inside that jar. Oh dear. Now to save the pickled pup, res res rescuers tranquilized it and then poured water over its body to cool it down, then took some lotion and eventually pried it off. The small coyote recovered in the shade with a dish of water and was monitored until it began to be able to move on its own again. Conservation officers say this rescue underscores the need for you to clean your jars when you put them out for recycling. Oh, I'm glad it's safe again. I, I watched that last night. I was like, oh, oh, it's almost there. Yeah, so almost there, close, almost so there. Close. Oh, give it time. He'll it, be all right. Did a good job, looks like. Yes, uh, did. The wily e. coyote safe and sound. Mm -hmm. All right, you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash vc. And I'll be back here with your late local news at 11 o'clock right after the national. Good night. Good night.